So today I'd like to share this presentation with you on the topic of photography. And for those of you who know me, you know that this is um, one of my favorite topics on your book. In fact, it's how I got involved with your book as a student in both a middle school and high school, being the student photographer. So I love sharing this. I've shared this um, presentation by request several times with schools, and uh, I thought I'd make a video on it so we can share it whenever it's convenient for you to watch. So with that said, we are gonna talk about cameras and photos here today. Now I'm going to start off by saying there's you know two main topics skills and gear and really for this presentation we are going to be focusing on techniques rather than the tools. Now I'll pause on that and add for those of you who know me you also know I love camera gear. <laughs> I love equipment, I love cameras, gadgets and seeing what they can do to elevate my photography. With that said, that stuff will always come and go, it will always change, evolve, and get better over time, um, but none of that matters unless we have the basic techniques, and that's why I'm focusing on that in this presentation. So don't get me wrong, I love cameras. Um, if you have any questions about camera settings, and we're going to talk about a couple very broad topics here today, um, but feel free to reach out and we can talk more offline as well. To illustrate that, I did put up these two photos here on the screen, um, both of which I took at very different times, very different equipment. And the example here I'm trying to make is, you know, I took this back with a 35 millimeter um, basic film camera back in the day, and then most recently this with my current DSLR uh, digital. So you'll notice, you know, it's clear that the new stuff is better, right? Technology gets better, lenses are better, um, sensors are better than film and, and film speed and all that. But my point in sharing these two is they're both good photos and there will always be something better. So quick story, when I took this one most recently, um, and this is equipment that I've you know added over time and when I have money saved up to get another lens or whatnot, kind of slowly add over the decades, I'm dating myself, to the camera bag. Um, as I took this photo, standing next to me was a professional photographer from the local paper, and I was chatting with him a little bit, and he probably had a good $30,000 worth of camera gear on his person to shoot the track meet. So my point here is there's always something better. It's frankly you know, not obtainable for all of us listening to this video because it's really for the pros who use it for um, bigger events. So my point here is you can always make what you have work and my goal today is to focus on techniques rather than those tools to squeeze the best out of it. And frankly, sometimes, you know, a phrase I heard from a fellow photographer was the best camera is the one in your pocket. You know, in today's world, that's often our iPhone or Android device that has a pretty good camera on it. So, you know, we, you can you can get a lot out of something like that. And obviously there's pros and cons, um, a, a, what I call a real camera, you know, a D DSLR with a nice lens on it is always better, but again, it's a slippery slope. So my goal here is to focus on some basics and then we can talk one-on-one -on -one, and I'm happy to help you, you know, specific camera settings. Today we're not talking about, you know, Nikon versus Canon versus Sony because frankly, they're all good. I don't have a, a strong preference one or the other. I simply shoot Nikon because that's always what I did and therefore the equipment can just grow in time. So a lot of the stuff I have is old and some of the stuff is new but it all works together because it's one that's the only reason i stay with nikon i'm not here to say it's better or worse than any other but it's just consistency with you know equipment working together so that's about it for equipment today we're going to talk about some basics at the end we will talk about some general rule of thumbs for settings on different topics shooting at school so today we're going to talk about center of interest varying angles depth of field i bolded that because that's my favorite topic and a really cool technique that we're going to show some examples on leading lines pattern and repetition capturing peak of emotion because that's really here on your book or if you're on newspaper watching that's what it's all about you know we're trying to story t tell a story uh, through images so capturing that peak of emotion is important uh, rule of thirds and framing so composing good photos we're going to talk a lot of a lot of different topics and the, the first one I put up here is never stand and shoot, right? So I would say back to that camera bag analogy, the best piece of equipment you guys have is actually your feet. <laughs> it's not the camera, it's not the lens, it's moving around and getting different perspectives. Find high and low angles to isolate your center of interest and just capture those different perspectives. And generally those straight on pictures, 
you know, we, generally, you know, that's what everyone does, called a snapshot, if you will. Um, but generally, those are less pleasing than the higher angle or the lower angle. So look, look at varying your, your angles. Shooting from a below, you know, makes the subject appear larger in the foreground. We're going to look at some examples. And the same is true above, makes the subject look smaller, the opposite. Here are some quick examples from one of our workshops in the past. You know, this photo here, you know, I was more or less, you know, on the ground pointing up with my camera to get that low angle. Uh, this one, I believe I was on a chair to get kind of the, you know, that higher angle looking down. And this one's just a general shot, right? It's, it's not bad. It's just to show you the differences between the high, low, and just your standard angle. You know, but these are really good. A wide angle, basic shot as an establishing shot to show what's going on where these really focus on the detail. Here's another great example. And by the way, as we go through this, you're going to see some really cool photos uh, from students all over the U.S. that we've noted here who, who took the photo, and some of mine did as well. But this is a really cool low angle shot, giving the photo depth with you know the, the foot close in the foreground. Okay, so depth of field, some terms. Uh, depth of field creates that perspective, and, and by definition, it's really how much of the photo is in focus. And we're going to look at some examples. Here's a photo I took at graduation a couple years ago, and this is what's referred to as a very shallow or narrow, you'll hear both, both ways, a very shallow depth of field, meaning I opened up the lens aperture all the way, which gives you one plane of focus. I focused on the student's um, eyes. You always kind of want to focus in on their eyes. So this makes sure their, their eyes are razor sharp, and then everything in front of this graduate and everything behind goes blurry, intentional. This is that depth of field. This is why I love, as I highlighted on the, on the first slide, depth of field really lets you isolate your subject and give the photo a real professional look. And it's really just a basic camera function by opening the aperture all the way. Here's another example. I took this um, with the first, uh, I'll call it real lens I bought. <laughs> this is probably good 10 years ago. And um, you know, unfortunately, the real lenses, as I jokingly say, are ones with fast aperture. So a wide open lens, same thing here, focus on the eye of the bird. And, um, you know, right in that plane of focus, you got some water droplets in focus, and then everything in front and everything in back goes blurry intentionally to give the photo some depth. Another great example, more, you know, practical to what we're going to do for your book, um, senior photo kind of thing, or you might do a call out or an editorial on a student. Same thing here, wide open lens, um, focused right on her eye and everything in front and in back goes blurry. And you notice the wall right here, which is on the same plane, is sharp in focus. And that really draws attention to the main subject of the photo. Okay, leading lines, much like when I just showed you with the doorknob and the brick wall, um, this helps the eye follow patterns to the center of interest, especially from the foreground to the background. So much like the one I just showed you with the wall kind of leading your eye into the student's face and going, um, you know, soft focus on the back. Here's a, a, a literal leading line, uh, Cub Scouts, with the rope coming in and leading your eye to the students. Same thing with the boat, leading lines to the subject. Okay, composing good photos continued. We're going to talk about simplicity. You really want to try to isolate your subject and crop, as it says here, before you snap. So you really want to get close in on your main subject. So change perspective as necessary to reduce that background clutter. And don't be afraid to fill the frame. You're going to see a continuous pattern here in this presentation about moving closer, closer, closer. Um, because the closer you get to your subject and using various techniques to highlight that subject, it tells a story of that person. And in our world, the action at school, whether it's um, an athletic event or whatnot, um, but you want to really isolate that part of the picture um, to tell the story. Great example of you know those leading lines that seem to fly away from the focal point, the welding. Really cool image. OK, so we're now we're going to look at patterns, repetition, and more about angles. So patterns draw the eye in, right? They break, it breaks the repetition and provides that pop and brings you again to the focus of that, that, that image and that, the, the draw of that photo. So examples of that, stairs, uh, lanes, rows, you know, all these things can create that repeated drum and you're gonna see an example of that in a second. And then you disrupt it with the subject. So you draw their attention to that. So again, experiment with different angles, high and low. Here's a simple example of that. 
with the basketball players, they're all looking one way, same jersey. You know, you got that pattern, the leading line going off into the distance. And then you have that one student turned around facing the camera, drawing your eye into that one student. Here's a literal angle, right? So um, for those of you listening, if, if you've been involved in shooting with drones at all, it's kind of a new thing. It's a fad, right? Everyone's doing it right now. Um, the way I look at it is it's, it's just a really cool, really tall tripod. <laughs> it lets you get that different perspective that you couldn't otherwise get in, in the past. So um, might make a separate video on that, but if, if anyone's interested in more information about drones, please feel, feel, feel free to contact me. I'd love to share with you. It's been a learning process for me uh, to follow the ever-changing regulations and follow the rules and got, you know, I earned my license with the FAA because that's what you're supposed to do. And there's a lot of rules that come along with it. But you know, here's a really simple example of an elevated perspective and just giving you a different view of a pretty normal picture of your school, right? But getting up to, you know, this is only like 100 feet, but getting a different point of view. Okay, so we have the seated graduates in this image that have that pattern throwing their hats, and then your eyes, the you know, with this one uh, student standing up throwing the cap, it breaks that pattern and draws your attention in. More on composing good photos. You, again, we talked about in the beginning, peak of emotion, where we're telling a story. So you want to make sure you ca uh, capture the emotion that tells that story. And that can be both the action and also the reaction. So put yourself at a game, whatever that game might be. You know, Obviously, you're going to get the action on the field, but you also want to spin around and get the fans, for example, as a reaction. So this image, you know, draws you in. It's a split second. Um, I took this you know, golfing and, and being able to capture the emotion on his face. I got lucky, or I just took a lot of photos, honestly, <laughs> to capture the ball in midair because that moves fast. But I also see the sand kind of flying up as he's you know, getting out of the sand trap. So just an example of um, drawing, you know, showing emotion and capturing uh, motion very quickly. Again, fast shutter speed lets you help you stop that. This image draws you in as these two teammates, you know, high five and jump in the air. And um, you'll note the illust the note on the bottom left corner. We'll talk more about that later. But you know, this is a photo illustration using selective color, and I use that technique to also draw your eye into those two players and black and white on the other on all the others to kind of fade that into the background a little bit. Obvious picture here, right? Action, reaction of the other the other players. I think this is cool. I'm always amazed uh, watching uh, the gymnastics meets and how they can, the strength that goes into this. So obviously we're catching him um, holding on there. And then uh, frame, framing wise, we have the coach looking up and you see as his hand is ready to catch him uh, just in case. So um, just a cool image of showing the action and reaction. Now this, again, storytelling. I'm hoping that this image helps tell that story and it would need a caption possibly to add to it in the yearbook. But um, the point here is, you know, this student um, walking away with her hands on her head, you know, she thought she made a goal, but the goalie, as you see him walking away, uh, just told her otherwise. And that's her reaction to that. So again, capturing emotion and reaction. Okay, rule of thirds. So this is one of those basics, right? So um, imagine a tic-tac-toe board in your viewfinder and by the way this you can turn on on most mobile phones again back to um, using our phones as cameras it's usually labeled a grid you just turn it on and it does it for you so you can see it in the viewfinder um, and most cameras really do it too you just have to turn it on so you see it in the viewfinder but um, what you want to do is place your main subject at the intersection of one of these points and you're going to see an example here in a second and you generally want to allow the face um, sorry, the, the subject to face in to the center of the image. So what we're going to do is we're going to put up this tic-tac-toe board so you see what I mean. And where those points intersect, highlighted with the red circles, is generally, rule of thumb, um, where you want to place your subject. So I'm going to flip through a couple examples here and then put that tic-tac-toe board up. And now I'm going to show some without the board just to illustrate. And once you start thinking this way as you're shooting and looking at that visual that that tool on the on the screen to where those intersections meet and placing your subject there it just becomes natural for you to do so so for example this graduate here you know 
the tendency as you're as you're learning photography in the beginning the tendency is to just put your subject dead center and as we said in the beginning that's generally not what you want to do you actually want to put them at one of those intersections of the rule thirds so this one is very clear as you imagine that tic-tac-toe board her face is right in the middle of that um, this dad at graduation he's a little off but generally right where that tic-tac would go same here same here and again with the flying camera the drone same with the water tower there so just some other examples of rule of thirds okay now we're going to talk about framing using structures and nature and shadows to create frames for your subject to help tell that story um, so framing can also create that that depth that depth of field that perspective we're going to look at some examples of that here so this one i took looking through you know, lattice at an outdoor event. It was another student gathering, and I kind of moved a little bit with the camera, again, my feet, <laughs> uh, to get this one student framed up within this framework. The only thing, if I could retake this photo, we talked about simplicity. I would have preferred, and I, maybe I should have stood there longer to, to wait for it to happen, that some of these students were either not here or turned around again just to draw attention to the main subject so there's one example of that this one is awesome i didn't take this photo i wish i had this is beautiful you know framing the picture like this that's just awesome again you could just get full frame of the picture but how cool is this and it helps tell the story a little bit better um, this one was from the drone as well and we had you know we have students down on the field creating the shape now uh, they do this every year we do it for the end sheets once in a while and having the fire truck come up on this long arm and the photographer is actually here taking the photo and the fireman's looking back because uh, i kind of caught him off guard so you gotta be careful with that we told everyone but the fireman and uh, he heard the buzzing uh, camera behind him so anyway but using this to kind of frame the photo and give it some depth if, as you can imagine if this weren't here it would just be this wide angle shot of the students down there having this in the foreground gives the image more depth Okay, here's a photo checklist, things to look for both while you're shooting and then reviewing your photos later so you can tweak your approach next time you go out. You wanna make sure your colors are vivid, your subject is clear and sharp. We've talked a lot about blurry backgrounds and foregrounds intentionally, but those unintentional blurs you wanna avoid, obviously. Uh, clean and crisp, caution using higher ISO. Again, more about camera settings, we can talk more about that if you're interested. But the, the end result there is as that ISO number goes up, the images tend to get grainier. Make sure your center of interest is clear. You know, we've talked a lot about that and drawing the eye to the main event, the, the subject of the image. And then you know, capturing that action and reaction. Again, telling that story. No mergers. So make sure objects are not growing from someone's head <laughs> simple example of this and it happens sometimes but you know say you're on the field and you're shooting soccer and the goal post is behind uh, one of the players and when you look at the photo later you'll notice the goal post is coming directly out of their head obviously at a fast paced game like that um, it just happens by mistake and we take lots of photos we just pick the one that doesn't have that but more something that you might be working on staging more, let's say a, a club photo, if you will, for the, for the yearbook. Um, you wanna make sure when you line the students up that you, if you do it outside, for example, you know, you don't have a tree or a flagpole <laughs> coming out of someone's head. So just look out for mergers. Now this photograph is really cool um, by a student in California here. And this photo uses a slow shutter speed to create this blur and give it that dramatic look in the background of those leading lines so what this is is this student um i certainly couldn't do this <laughs> this student is holding still for a long time really in reality because those lines are tail lights of a car or cars so by slowing down the camera shutter we're allowing those cars to drive through the background of the scene and create that blur effect really cool and the subject just needs to hold still while doing so. Now again, I didn't take this photo, so I don't know for sure, but this might have also used the flash to freeze uh, the action here, possibly, something to consider. Okay, understanding the sun and using it to our advantage, because sometimes it can be a challenge. Um, in the sun, direct sunlight 
as you all know, puts direct shadows on people's faces and it makes us squint, right? If you've ever been on the other side of the team or other side of the picture, I should say, well, someone's taking a photo, um, you know, you're staring at the sun, you're squinting, you have shadows. If you're sweaty, if it's hot out, it's highlighting that. Um, so you want to avoid basically, if you can, the middle of the day, the direct sun. And when possible, move that group subject, whatever it is, under some shade, maybe use a tree for shade. We're gonna look at an example here in a second. And also if you need to use a fill flash to help soften those shadows. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. That indirect sunlight, you know, found under the tree, for example, really helps soften that that look, you remove some of the shadows. So when you can, you want to really pull people under a tree to do a photograph. Here's a quick example of that. As you might imagine, if I'd taken this picture just in the middle of the day with the sky, you know, all of this background image here would be really, really bright, and their faces would likely be very dark, just because of the extreme difference between the direct sun and their face in the shadow. So by walking these students over to the tree, the photographer was able to reduce that ratio, we'll talk about that in a minute, and get the ratio closer so we could actually see their face. So again, un overcast is your friend. Um, it might be counterintuitive if, if photography is new to you, but those hazy or cloudy days are actually the best days to photograph, right? Because uh, it gives you that nice, soft, diffused light and distributes it rather than that direct sun that gives you those you know, harsh shadows, makes people squint. Um, sunrise and sunset are also ideal. It gives you a nice color. We're gonna look at that in a second. You know, another option for backlighting a subject and more drama is putting the sun to someone's back. Now you gotta be careful with that because sometimes it overpowers, but here's a quick example of that here. Um, you know, it's kind of cool. It also gives you that shadow uh, to play with as well as this little outline that we refer to as backlighting around, around their heads. So, you know, try to do that too. Again, you're gonna take many photos of an event, uh, but sometimes putting the sun behind their back can work out really well like this example shows. Okay, talking about time. So again, noon is the worst. It's just hard, right? It's the harshest light in the middle of the day and uh, you just wanna kind of avoid that. Again, using flash or shade to help diffuse or soften that light. Morning and afternoon, you know, earlier and, and later, latter part of the days are better, right? And it gives you that optimum exposure with warmer tones. And I mentioned we were gonna show an example, you know, sun, I think this was sunset. Uh, sunrise and just giving you that warmer tone with the sun. So as you see it on his face, it's just a nice color, got the nice shadow behind him. It, it's a pretty good example. Also, if you notice, it really demonstrate that, demonstrates that rule of thirds as well. Okay, now we're gonna talk about lighting ratio. I mentioned it earlier and I wanna explain it in a little bit more detail. So the lighting ratio compares the amount of light in the shadow areas to the, to the light areas, okay? because our eyes and our brain <laughs> um, can rec can see both, okay? But a camera isn't capable of doing that. When it sees harsh light, and this is a prime example, um, or this window here, maybe more, a little more clear, or the school bus here, when there's really extremes, right? So on the school bus, the sky is really bright and it's really dark down here. The camera cannot record, whether it's film or digital in, in our current technology, it, in one picture, it cannot record all extremes, even though the human eye can. So there's a couple ways to address that. One is obviously changing a lighting environment, which we talked about, direct sun versus shade or fill flash. The other, and, and this is often referred to now as HDR, and it stands for uh, high dynamic range, I believe. And essentially what it does is it lets the camera and by the way, the iPhone and probably Android actually has a button on it that says HDR and you can turn this feature on and it does all the magic for you. Um, what it does is it takes multiple exposures and blends them together. And these are examples of that, right? We have an overexposed, a normal, and an underexposed. And this is exactly what the iPhone, for example, and I only speak to that because that's what I use, um, but I'm assuming you know Android devices do the same thing. What it's doing is it's taking this Overexposed, okay, where the, this is just all white, we can't see any detail. The underexposed, where you can start to see what's through that bright part, the window, and right in the middle, and it blends it into one image called an HDR image. Here's another example of that. 
And this, you know, if you're at school taking pictures, this is more analogous to, say, a group photo and they happen to be standing in front of a window, <laughs> which we want to avoid doing. But if it happens, you know, here's how to deal with it. HDR is one solution, you know, redirecting and using flash and all that primarily. But this is one option to look at. Um, you know, if this were a classroom environment in this picture, you know, most likely this outside view through the window and the door would just be white, right? Because it's so bright outside, so much darker inside, that ratio is so off that the camera can't record it. HDR takes a bunch of images, as I explained here, and combines it into one so we can actually see both the inside and the outside. And same with the school bus example here. Really dark, middle, too light, and merges it into one. Now I did I just googled these and this school bus one is actually a good example of sometimes HDR doesn't work so well <laughs> um, and I've noticed this on my phone as well when I take an image sometimes it looks fake and this is a good example of honestly this probably a bad example of HDR but I want to share it because sometimes when it does its algorithm and whatever it does the end result is not good <laughs> this is one example of that this image almost looks embossed or it just looks fake so sometimes it doesn't work well so that low ratio is um, when the background, I'm sorry, when, when we'll have both having detail, okay? So that, that window example, when the, low, when the ratio is low, that means there isn't this huge gap between bright and dark. And that's where the camera can record it well. That high ratio is where you're going to lose detail in one or the other because it's just too drastic between the two. Some examples of that. High ratio at the top, low ratio at the bottom. Um, this is an old photo I took in high school, black and white film days, but the same thing holds true. Um, as the high jumper is going, you'll see the sky, you can barely see it. It's just totally white. Um, same here with this picture, but I tried to fix it with HDR. The, the school bus is darker than outside, and that's actually a school building. Before using HDR, this was just white, so it kind of brings that in. Same thing here. Uh, from the helicopter, the drone, it does this already. It does the HDR for us and it kind of blends the images together so we get the bright sky and, and the ground all exposed correctly. Um, this example is not HDR. This was just me on my feet moving the camera a little bit to make sure the background behind, you know, for the senior photo sitting um, wasn't too drastic. So, you know, I deliberately positioned the trees and the color in this case because it was fall to make sure that these were all properly exposed and she wasn't too dark and the background wasn't the bright sky okay adding light so now we're going to talk about flash i don't use flash a lot personally i i prefer to work with available light natural light but sometimes in the examples you've seen we need to do so so um, it can add that artificial light when there isn't enough now this is an example up here, and again, I just got this on Google. This is where we're not using any flash, and it's just direct sun, all those shadows we talked about. This is direct flash, basically on autopilot. What it's doing is it's throwing a lot of light at the subject's face. Sometimes it's fine, sometimes it's not, because it, it just makes them so bright, stark white, and the background goes black. And you can see how the background starts to go black. This example, as it says, is a softbox flash. So some settings we do on the on the flash unit, whether it's on the camera or built in, um, to basically turn the power down. So it puts less light out. And then a softbox is literally, you know, a diffuser that you put over the flash to give it a softer view or a softer look instead of this harsh light. So as you can see, you know, it helps to fill in this flat the the shadows and when done right, it also, the, the fill flash doesn't allow the backdrop to go as dark as it would if it's just on autopilot. So that's that's fill flash. Um, again, as we talked, it fills the shadows. And here's an, a good note to remember, you know, flash doesn't work very far. <laughs> so if you are using flash, keep in mind, it really only travels from you to your subject and this is generous, 5 to 15 feet. It doesn't go very far. Um, more expensive flashes are more powerful and they go further, but generally you need to be relatively close to your subject uh, when using a flash, so just keep that in mind. Really cool example of some pretty 
um, fancy flash unit strobes <laughs> and obviously this is not during an actual swim meet it's during practice or a photo shoot kind of thing that you might do for your book um, but they're really cool right and it's a lot of flash power to freeze the action the droplets are frozen and again the background goes black you can't see the rest of the pool which is fine this might be a really cool divider picture right for athletics or something like that okay I said we're not gonna talk about cameras too much, but we are gonna talk some basic settings that apply to everyone. So we're not speaking to Nikon or Canon or Sony. Again, this is just general settings. So for action shots, and generally speaking, this is just my personal preference, I tend to shoot an aperture priority, which means I set my aperture, the f-stop, and the camera matches the appropriate shutter speed, okay? So generally speaking, for action shots, you need to have the largest aperture possible. And I simply say that rather than quoting you a number like f2.8, because that will depend on your lens. Remember, the goal here is to squeeze as much out of the equipment you have without going into a budget that's just unobtainable, <laughs> okay? So the largest aperture on your lens, whatever that might be, is basically the f-stop number and the smallest number you can achieve. Uh, for example, a common one is like f3.5 on a lens that might come with a camera that you buy as a kit. Um, the smaller the number, the better to freeze action and to yield that, that shallow depth of field you've seen me show examples of. So again, largest aperture, the smallest f-stop number you can do on your camera is what you're looking for for action shots. So turn that dial all the way to you know 1.8, 2.8 would be awesome. Um, it just, those lenses tend to cost more money. So if it's 3.5 or 4, whatever that number is, the smallest number will help you achieve that. And then after you shoot, you know, review. Review your photographs. I do this to this day. To analyze, and if, you, if you're using a digital camera, it's already recording all this for you. You just open it up in, you know, Lightroom or Photos that I use on the Mac or Photoshop. And it, it's probably recording your f-stop for you, your shutter speed for you, your ISO. So you can review that information later as you come back and look at your photos. So, for example, the golf pictures you saw, the soccer pictures. You know, look at those later after the shoot is done. And if the soccer ball is a little bit blurry, like the one I shared earlier, um, you know, re reference what time of day it was, how sunny it was, and your shutter speed. And then just make a mental note for next time you guys go out and shoot that you'll need a slightly faster shutter speed to freeze the action. Golf, you know, that little ball is very fast. <laughs> so you need to look at that shutter speed and accommodate for that fast moving ball if you want to freeze it like in the picture I shared earlier. So again, just look at all those options that you set on the camera in a review phase to see what happened, why. So next time you go out, you can just make a couple little tweaks and see how that changes it. We've covered this, it requires the fast shutter speed to freeze the action. Um, the downside, everything in photography usually has a give and take, right? The downside to that, depending on all other things like your lens and how fast it is, is to achieve that faster shutter speed, you often need to increase the ISO or flash. Um, generally speaking, especially if we're talking sports, you guys aren't allowed to use flash as it distracts the players. Um, so that's usually off the board, but usually in order to speed up that shutter speed to freeze the action, we're gonna have to increase that ISO number, a larger number. You may recall in the beginning, I mentioned the, the blurry, right? Or um, images that don't look sharp. Unfortunately, the trade-off there is once you start going too high, that'll just depend on your camera, but too high with this ISO number, the images start to look grainy. So there's there's a trade-off there. Okay, so basic settings for a group photo. This is the opposite, right? Fast shutter speed is not important. In fact, we don't want it because the, the downside, right, to that fast shutter speed and all the sports photos I shared with you are you have one thing in focus, your primary subject, and everything in front and in back is blurry, which is really cool for fill in the blank, athletic event, um, but it's really terrible for a group photo because we want all those rows of people in focus. So if you're shooting a group photo, say club day at school, and you need to get a picture of all the clubs, and you line students up in a row, and many rows, and they you know go maybe three, four rows back, you actually want the exact opposite, right? You want to close down the lens and then just a general reference point, 
f8 or higher on the camera, so larger number on the f-stop, um, to therefore give more depth, more in focus, right? So we want all the rows in focus. So we're going to close this down uh, to allow the focus to be greater. Instead of just one thing, razor sharp, and everything else front and back blurry, this will give more things in focus. So you, you want to do that to make sure the rows are in focus. Um, what I want to highlight here with this picture at the bottom um, is the idea of a pinhole camera. So let me jump to that. Because once you master these two functions, um, which is shutter speed and aperture, you can really control everything in photography. It's really cool. And to illustrate how simple that is, your camera basically does two things, right? You have aperture and shutter speed. Everything else are bells and whistles. And again, you heard me say this in the beginning, I love those bells and whistles, and they're fun to play with and see how they can tweak images and capabilities a little bit. But in the end, a camera, no matter what camera you guys have, does two things, aperture and shutter speed. How large is the opening on the lens and how long is that open? And to illustrate that, if you guys wanna Google or go on YouTube specifically, pinhole camera for a fun project. Um, this is an example, and I did this when I was in photo class in high school myself. It's literally like a Kleenex box or an Amazon box today. And um, you, you paint it black inside, you seal it off, you literally poke a hole in it with a pin, that's the aperture, and then you put a little piece of tape or something over the front to open it up and allow light into the box, that's your shutter speed, and you emulate what a camera does. Again, everything else is just um, icing on the cake, and it's great, and it lets you do a lot of cool things by all the gadgets they've added to it, HDR being a great example of that, um, that a pinhole doesn't do. It's very basic, but if you want a, a fun project to do at school, on your book staff, or just at home, just Google that, and you'll see some videos about how it works. It's pretty cool, and it really illustrates how simple a camera should be. <laughs> I think we've often complicated it and it's harder to learn when you look at a camera, a modern camera, and you see all these dials and all these settings and you know there's a sports button and a flower button and a mountains button sometimes and it gets confusing. I think it's a really cool exercise to just see the basics of photography. Even if you don't do it, you can Google it. Um, there's other options for you to, to make like a viewing box, if you will. And again, you'll see that on YouTube. But it just helps you understand those two basic functions, aperture and shutter speed. Okay, so photo variety and telling that story. You know, you want to set you want to set the setting. You want to transport your viewer, um, set the scene. This is where we talk about those establishing shots. If you remember from the beginning of the presentation here, we talked about um, that activity where I was on the ground looking up at the students, building that structure, looking down in that general wide shot. Um, setting the scene, that general wide shot is still good. You know, so you establish what's happening. And they shouldn't, you know, describe the overall environment. Again, angles, we talked a lot about that. And introduce folks to the people, you know, in the activity, whatever that might be. You want to tell the story of each person. And get closer, get closer, no closer, as it says here. <laughs> I mentioned that's a kind of a repeating element here. You want to get closer because there's nothing worse than standing far back, standing in one place, getting this, frankly, boring wide picture, right? And that's all you get. You really want to move around. You've heard me talk about the feet, best tool in your camera bag, move around, get different perspectives, but also get closer to the action and fill that frame. Cropping, it's very important. We already talked about that, the crowd shot. You know, always look for people standing out and you know, getting reactions to the action. Really cool example here, showing the primary action, obviously, but you can see um, people in the background, even though it's a little blurry on, on purpose, uh, but you froze an action and a reaction to people cheering on. So on that reaction, you wanna focus on you know faces, gestures, postures, get closer, closer, closer. You wanna, you wanna capture emotion, right? Um, all of us in the room, even if there's some watching this video on newspaper staff or your book, um, we're all trying to do the same thing. We're trying to tell that story, so get closer. Good point to stick around. A lot of the photos I've got at um, especially athletic events, you get the, you know, the, the, the conclusion of the game, you get that winning shot, really cool. Too often than not, you walk away. And I can tell you from experience, sticking around for a little bit, helping tell that story of the reaction to the game on both 
both teams, um, you get some really cool emotion to capture. So stick around. And um, yeah, capture the event as it happens. You know, you're gonna get people in the stands, you know, screaming, jumping, all that fun stuff. Um, be patient. You want to get the you know that climax of action, the last second shots, or the kiss at the school play kind of thing. Now, shooting during practices and rehearsals, great. I, I did that a lot when I was a student um, because you can get you know theater, for example, you can get right up on stage. You know, ask first, of course, but. Uh, you can get right up on stage, just caption such, so we know when it's printed in the book that this was a rehearsal or a practice. Um, if you remember back to the picture I shared of the high jumper, that was not during a meet. That was a practice, and I went out with my, my buddies, and I asked them if they would do that a few times so I could capture it on film. Um, so sometimes you get some really good images that way because you can control the environment more. You know, It's just right to caption it such. Again, angles and perspectives we've talked about. So here are just more examples of golf and showing narrow depth of field, shallow depth of field. Um, I, I like stuff like this when I'm shooting to use as maybe a background for a yearbook page or um, a graphic element. You know, it's, it's a golf ball. It's not even the player, but you never know when you might want to use something like that. Again, same. Um, personally, I, I took this one. I don't like how she's dead center. Again, rule of thirds, I would have preferred she be over here, um, but the ball is frozen in action. That's, you know, kind of cool. This one's framed a little bit better where she's standing. You can see her face. You can still see the ball um, watching in, you know, and framing it with you know, the equipment and looking through. Um, capturing the event. Now, again, for those of you who know me, I'm not a big sports fan. However, when the Cubs won, you know, I took some time off and I went down to this parade because it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Talk about emotion and capturing emotion. Really cool event. You know, this kind of image is the obvious one, you know, holding that. Um, I liked this pattern with this one person in the middle smiling and kind of stands out from all the others. You know, some basic framing with the trees and water tower and just showing the mass quantity of people, reaction to the action. And I always think these are kind of interesting shots to get. You don't always use them, but it's kind of cool to have because it's part of our world now. We all have our phones they're all, <laughs> and they're always on when they're an event. So I like to usually capture at least one image of someone taking a photo through the phone from their perspective. Again, more examples of framing and narrow depth of field. Um, same graduation you've seen photos from earlier where they're blurred out, but this time I focused on the parents watching the event. Um, turning around and capturing friends, you know, hollering behind me and reaction to the event. And these two images I put in to show perspective and again, using your feet to get where you need to be. Um, the typical place to stand at graduation, if you haven't shot before, it can be a little bit intimidating and you don't wanna, you know, disrupt things and you certainly wanna get permission to do so. Um, but typically you wanna stand and you'll, you'll, you might be standing in the back of the sidelines and you'll get the back of the graduates which is fine for some photos, but you know how, how cool is it to get from their perspective? So you know I was basically, for these two images, standing right behind the principal and the administration. You know I asked them first to let them not be there shooting for, for your book, and you get their faces of the graduates and their experience receiving their diplomas in the flower. So again, perspective and moving to the right place in the room to capture that. Okay. So we've talked a lot about um, variety and telling the story, the scene setters, those detail shots getting really close that words may not be able to capture. Um, look for those small moments, you know, behind the scenes, quiet emotion, close portraits, you know, getting close <laughs> for a third time, getting close. Um, and work with that wide open aperture to reduce the depth of field. You've heard me say that a few times on show examples and I hope those have helped illustrate why I like it so much having that narrow depth of field really you know draws attention to your subject <clears throat> more examples of that again narrow depth of field blurry sharp blurry a little bit if there are more people here uh, same thing with the graduate holding the tassel out sharp blurry you know giving it depth um, same thing moving my feet to get behind the graduate this time and getting this really you know fun reaction of the principal looking at the student must have been a, a backstory there an in, uh, inside joke um, and then looking over the graduates again, again, different perspectives, seeing the audience. Just more examples of a graduation showing different perspectives, detail, right? So you got the hats, you got throwing the caps, you know, joking around afterwards, holding our diplomas, again, the phone shot, 
Um, wide angle shot, looking over someone's shoulder is fun. Okay, well now we're gonna talk about ethics very briefly, um, but it's really important. So um, because digital photography is really, really just the way it is, you know, when I learned photography it was in the dark room and it was, it was a lot harder to make changes to photo and it was just more involved in time. Now it's easy. We can all do this on our iPhone or, or computer in Photoshop. So it's just become normal. Um, but it's brought the question of photo ethics. So you really need to just consider this because you know we're in the world of yearbook and newspaper and we're looking at um, images that are recording history and being printed for a long time. So photo ethics, in short, you really don't want to alter without clarification. So if you think back to that photo I shared where I mentioned there was a photo illustration and labeled such on the bottom because I made it black and white um, through some you know color correction and all that. Um, you can do so, um, but you need to note it. Clearly label it as I did in that example as a photo illustration. And you want to explain how it's changed. So I said photo illustration with color selection or selective color. I think I put in the caption. Now contouring is what we talked about with HDR and this example again that we looked at with the high jumper. So as he's jumping over the bar, um, you know, is an old photo, right? Black and white. He, the exposure is good, but it's all bright up here. So it has been considered acceptable to what's called contouring the photo. And that's where HDR comes in or other techniques of bringing the sky in more because the camera, again, can't record it, but the human eye can. So and really, we're bringing this photo by contouring the image and you know correcting that somehow, technique, HDR or otherwise, and making the sky show up more. That's considered acceptable still. Um, because it really doesn't alter reality. That's really what happened. That's really what we saw <laughs> when we watched this happen in real life, but the camera wasn't able to record it. We kind of fixed it, um, Photoshop or whatever, and that's still considered acceptable. But what we don't want to do is misrepresent reality, right? Um, it's now a, a thing to say Photoshop it <laughs> and adding a missing person to a group photo. That is clearly considered unethical in our world of journalism because it misrepresents reality. So we really, really don't want to do that. Um, for fun, you know, for your own use, have fun. I do it too. Um, you know, and this morphing and distorting features for fun, you know, that that's fine for just personal use, but it's not something we should be doing and then reproducing and sharing in a yearbook or newspaper. Um, that's really, really considered un unethical. So you want to make sure you don't do that. Really, the bottom line is altering reality. You just you, you shouldn't do that in our world of yearbooking. So, um, you just want to look at how the camera viewed it, and if it's easy to contour the photo, fix the photo back to reality because the camera was the limiting factor there. That's fine, um, but we really don't want to be adding people to group pictures or morphing people's faces. Um, that's just not what we should be doing, you know, in student student journalism. So as a team, these are pictures from Hinsdale South. I uh, hope you guys don't mind me sharing last year at distribution, but as a group, you guys watching, you are recording history at your school. So let's get out there and capture and tell that story of your school year together. And between storytelling via captions and writing, blended with photo storing via photos, you can do that even more. So thank you for watching. I hope you found that helpful. If you have any questions, you know where to find me. Talk to you soon. Thank you.